And now, here is our $50,000 mystery voice. It will be followed immediately by a clue. Listen carefully. <laughs> Hello, gang. Hello, gang. That was tonight's $50,000 mystery voice. Whose voice was that? And here is tonight's clue. It was not the voice of the 23rd President of the United States. contest in the middle of our show here. We're just trying to get along here. We're doing the best we can and always just try the best we can and every time we turn around. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, gang. Hi, George. It's good to see you. Poor slob. And uh, tonight, we'd like to take this opportunity to salute uh, 20th century culture, as represented by the uh, television movie listings. Doesn't this sound like a movie you'd like to see? I mean, here it is. It's on channels 6, 7, and 16. It comes on three channels. How's that for giving it your triple barrel? The wide, wide world of entertainment. Movie, Chant of Silence, starring Steve Forrest and Francis. A skyjacker parachutes to safety and poses as a novice monk in an isolated New Mexico monastery. And the police captain, masquerading as a visiting bishop, attempts to flush him out. An exciting film. So tonight, this concerned radio station, this concerned modicum of communications. Excuse me, it's mode of communications, right, gang? Is that right? I, I don't know, you know. My God, sometimes you don't know what's right, do you? Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Hey, we ought to do a commercial tonight. Why don't you spend your weekend in a room overlooking the swimming pool at the luxurious Watergate Hotel? Wouldn't that be kind of exciting, a historical place? <laughs> yes, tonight, this important radio station, deeply concerned, as it always is, with the future of mankind, tonight salutes the March of Culture. Marching on, marching bravely on, struggling against all odds. Uh, uh, reset that, please. We're going to need that. When you're saluting culture, you don't do it lightly, man. Yeah. A skyjacker disguised as a monk. You know, can't you just see, honest, you know, when I, when, I don't know whether you, you've ever been around when there's been a story conference. I doubt whether you have, but uh, I, I can just see this script writer selling the idea of this movie to uh, a producer named Sam. And uh, he says, hey, he says, Sam, he says, what's in the news, huh? How about making a relevant movie? I mean, a relevant movie. I'll tell you, I got an idea. I'm sitting there the other day by the pool, and I think of a, a fantastic idea. What's in the news? Now, I mean, outside of Watergate and all that stuff, what's in the news? I'll tell you what's in the news. Hijacking airplanes. Everywhere they're worrying about that, right? I go through the airport in Cleveland, and what do they do? They frisk me. I mean, just out of Cleveland, they frisk me. They take an x-ray picture of my pockets to make sure I don't have no gun. So I say to myself, they must be worried about hijackers, right? Okay. Now, what else are people interested in these days? Religion, huh? Right. There is a whole new thing. You know, the Jesus freaks and all that? A whole thing. Now, if you can combine the two, you got a socko smash. And I tell you, don't mention anybody. Don't, don't even mention this to Izzy, right? Because I know how he is with stealing them ideas of yours, right? He's the guy that's still gone with the wind, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, I want to tell you. Sit down, Sam. This is a goodie. Who you got on the lot now? Who you got on the contract? I mean, you know, somebody ain't using, huh? All right. Okay, you, how about Steve Forrest, huh? Yeah, you know, he's kind of a big guy. I guess Steve Forrest, Ann Baxter, right? Okay, we got Steve Forrest. Now, Steve Forrest is a runaway guy who is trying to get away from it all. He's got a bad wife, the whole scene, and he hijacks a 727. Now, we see him in the 727. Now, he is out over the waist someplace. You know how they, these guys jump out the parachutes, right? He then says, all right, give me a parachute. I'm going to jump out with three and a half million dollars. 
Give me the money and a parachute, and I'm going out. And, of course, at that point, we could have, say, somebody like uh, Ann Margaret would make a nice stewardess, right? Ann Margaret begs him not to jump. Don't jump because we are over a trackless wasteland. You are going to lose your life down there. Isn't it worth three and a half million dollars? At that point, he says, out of my way. I know what I'm doing. See, he actually knows what he's doing. Only he don't tell nobody, right? So they open up the back door. He jumps out. And at that point, the pilot says, we could get somebody like a Forrest Tucker. You know, he's sort of a, uh, yeah, you know, kind of rugged guy. Forrest Tucker's flying a plane. And Forrest Tucker says to Ed Margaret, poor devil, he does not know he is going down into a trackless waste. They will never find that poor devil. Three and a half million dollars will do him no good where he is going. And we see the plane flying off, and we see the parachute floating down. Now, he lands on a desert. And what does he do immediately? He opens up his backpack, which he has with him. And what's he got in the backpack? What do you hear this, Sam? He's got a monk suit. Uh, he puts the monk suit on. You know how the monk suit with the cowl, the thing goes over the head, you know? Uh, you know, like you've seen them things, you know, the long things. You've seen, well, Lawrence Olivier wears them a lot in the movies. And he puts this thing on. And everybody in the audience is going to say, what's he putting on a monk suit for? He climbs up over the next hill, and there you see, right below him, a monastery. Now, you've got the sound. Well, you remember them monk pictures. They're always big. You know, Bing Crosby, Barry Fitzgerald. Uh, you know how the, everybody loves to see that. He knocks on the door and says, I am a visiting monk. I am from a monastery, and I have traveled over the desert, and I am searching for my soul. And not only that, I want nothing but solitude. And I have come to, to devote myself to solitude, and I wish to have, uh, what do they call them things uh, uh, in the... In the uh, in the monastery, they have a retreat. He wants to retreat, and he wants to sit and contemplate his navel there. Well, of course, the monks, and we could get uh, some nice-looking guy like Edmund O'Brien. Make a nice monk. Uh, Edmund O'Brien is the father monk, and he says, Come right in, my son. And the music swells. We have this organ music playing, and now we know we got, what do we got? We got a skyjacker, and he's in with the monks. Well, all the monks are sitting there, and you know, they're writing with them quill pens. All the monks write with quill pens, you know. And we can use a lot of the stuff we got laying around in a property pot we ain't used in years, you know. Ever since Errol Flynn is gone, we got all this stuff. And, and we, we got them all sitting around writing on scrolls, see. And all the while, he has hidden the three and a half million dollars underneath. What do they call it? The monk placed them little pallets there. What he's sleeping on, you know. It's like kind of, kind of a sleeping bag there. And uh, he takes the money out, he hides it under there, and he's writing on the quill pen. And who's he writing to? He's writing to his confederate who is living in some place like, uh, oh, the, the Riviera. You know, we, I have got the dough now, and we're, and what happens? His letter goes through the chief monk. And what does the chief monk do but read it? Because, you know, they have to read all the mail that goes on. I want to make sure that he's not writing anything. Uh, you know, after all, they have a, a bow of silence. they got to write. So he sends it on, but at the same time, he calls his friend, who is an ex-monk. And by the way, it's very big today. Being an ex-monk and an ex-priest, we got three things going. And so he's got this ex-monk, this ex-priest monk, a friend of his, who is now a detective. <laughs> oh, now you're going to see it. Detective pictures are big, too. So you get this and get Gene Hackman to play this. He'd be very good with that, you know, and have his hair shaved with the, just the thing around the top there, you know, like the horseshoe. He disguises himself as the visiting bishop. And from there on, we're going to let the plot take care of itself. It's a winner now, Sam, a winner. <laughs> in three weeks. That's about the length of time it takes to print, uh, shoot, and distribute a picture of that type. All over the nation, there would be these announcements. Once in a generation, the motion picture is produced that speaks for all men of all time. The Religious Skyjackers, starring Steve Forrest and Ann Baxter. Rated PG, there are some scenes that your child may not want to see. All right, all right, all right. Thank you, thank you. Hold on, that's enough, that's enough. I don't overdo it. That's it, that's it. Didn't you, Dave, wouldn't you love to see that picture? Kind of missed that one. Channel 16. What the hell is on Channel 16 outside of the police call? 
Well, of course, you know, that brings up a whole, uh, you know, culture is changing all over the world. Would you please reset my culture music in there, please? And that while you're resetting my culture music, uh, there's nothing as cultural in today's life as a good, well-delivered, ringing commercial. And uh, I think I'll deliver one here for you. Uh, Mountain Valley. Oh, for heaven's sakes. It says, in a motor car, parts include the carburetor, the transmission, and the differential, and so on. <laughs> in another vehicle, your own body. Did you ever think of comparing your body with your Ford? There are parts like the heart, the kidneys, and the stomach. Now, all of you have heard of these parts. All of them are essential, along with so many more in that complex machine that's inside of you, taken away there. Now, the motor inside you must keep running day or night, sleep or awake, as long as you live. And uh, you should give it exceptionally good fuel. Mountain Valley water from Hot Springs, Arkansas, should be exactly right for that overhead valve you. When you drink Mountain Valley water, you'll be joining people who have been drinking this water for 40, 50, even 60 years, living testimonials to its excellent taste, the satisfying effect of America's only water to merit popularity across the nation. Oh, yes, uh, for a free folder and price list, or to have Mountain Valley Water delivered to you. You mail a card to me, Johnny Appleseed, in care of WOR, New York, 10018. That's me. Just write the simple word on it, water. I mean water. W-A-T-T-T-E-R. Water on it. Or you can telephone New York, and the number in New York is Bryant 95252. That's the New York Water Headquarters. Bryant 95252 in New Jersey. Uh, area 201-748-6868. Well, I, I, I've, I've been known to drink water occasionally. Little, little Jim Beam in there. Maybe a little twist of lemon. It, water's a very good drink, do you agree? Yes, sir. Very, very good. Uh, it's very, you know, it's very healthy. Very healthy. Yeah, so by the way, speaking of, of uh, water, I'll never forget, you know, that one time, if I may, if I may uh, uh, bring you a sick-making uh, image, and since we're on late now, we can indulge ourselves in a few of them images, right? I, uh, <laughs> I remember, oh boy, you talk about water. One time uh, in the Army, anybody, you know, if you've ever been in the Army, and if you've ever been in the field in the Army, you realize that uh, that there are certain... Uh, niceties of life that we take totally for granted in our daily lives. And, uh, for example, the fact that you can uh, change your socks is taken as, uh, you know, you just kind of accept that. You don't think much about that, right? Oh, I want to tell you one time, I was uh, for eight weeks in the field, and changing your socks was a major luxury. It was like, you know, Christmas and everything all good all rolled into one. And after Company K had been out for four and a half weeks in the field without changing its socks, I want to tell you, they didn't need radar to find us. No way. This is WOR New York. I, I told you it was going to make you sick, but uh, one time you did talk about water. One time, <laughs> one time we, went, we were out, we, 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 we were on a thing called a, called a, a, uh, a special environmental bivouac. Now, that's kind of an elegant name, meaning bad news. It uh, sounds pretty good, you know, environmental bad. You see the word environment and ecology all sounds kind of great today. But if you find yourself actually living in the environment, uh, it's not always the same as taking a hiking trip on the Appalachian Trail, which ain't exactly the rough world. We we uh we went out down this this environmental bivouac, and uh, I remember how it started. Uh, it uh, started in the following fashion, uh, and this was uh, you know uh, this is a veteran company. We've been in the army now for a long time, and uh, we knew what to expect. But the one thing about being uh, uh, being involved in the environment, really, you don't really know what to expect. <laughs> you can always it's a, it's all purely see the difference between a concept and the reality. Is often the difference between getting, uh, uh, you know, getting uh, having an experience which uh, will pursue you like a bad dream forever, and uh, you know that's why that's why today Shepard is a man who who, um, although albeit 
uh, he can he can deal with uh, with life as it is. Shepherd will always opt uh, for. I I don't put down the Holiday Inns anymore like I used to. Uh, <laughs> I really don't because one thing you do when you turn the the spigot, something comes out, and uh, that in itself can be an unimaginable luxury. An unimaginable luxury. And I'll give you an example why. We were to spend 30 days on an environmental bivouac. Now, 30 days in ordinary life isn't, you know, it's a month, it isn't too long. Kind of like the idea of spending 30 days out in the country, don't you? The New Yorkers have a thing they call, generically, the country. And uh, strangely enough, they even think of Jersey as the country. <laughs> That's called the country. Or going to Vermont as the country. Well, there's other stuff out there, friends. The real country is something else again. And uh, we went out, and this was in the Ozarks. And um, they got some real country out there. And uh, and uh, the, you know, it's the kind of country that, that nobody has ever set foot on. Not because it's uh, inaccessible or so rugged, just because it's so rotten. There's no point in setting your foot on it. Uh, you don't get any brownie points for climbing up and down the hills in the Ozarks. Nobody comes, you know, you're just never interviewed by Eric Severide when you climb to the top of one of those hills out there. You just climb to the top, sweating and uh, struggling upwards. And we finally got out to where we were to go, and it, it was something else. We were in the middle of of what they call in the, in the Ozarks, they have a phrase out there, which, uh, well, they call it a berry swamp. Do you know what a berry swamp is? Sounds kind of colorful, doesn't it? Well, a berry swamp is a swamp. And the reason they call it a berry swamp is that the only thing that grows in these swamps outside of cattails, turtles, and water moccasins is uh, these, these inedible berries. And they call it a berry swamp. Well, they're inedible to human beings. Other things come to eat the berries, like bears. They come down and eat the berries. And anything that happens to be around there I mean, they, they don't stop just at berries. I mean, that, the only reason they eat these berries is because that's all, you know, it's the only thing that's, it's the only game in town. So the bear comes down into the swamp and he starts eating the berries. And if he happens to see a PFC, this is an unexpected bonus. At which point then he has PFC garnished with berries. Uh, and so, <laughs> where we are, we're in the middle of this. And, and, and it was absolutely, it was like, it was like, uh, you know, 75 miles from the nearest human habitation. And the human habitation that it was nearest, you should have seen that. It was a shack made entirely out of old Coca-Cola signs in which seven hillbillies with webbed feet were living in a, in a state of total and constant incestuous relationship. Well, that was the nearest human habitation, barely human. I never saw a, a human being whose hair grew right down to the tip of his nose. Now that 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 was the the, the 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 chief of that clan that lived in that shack made out of Coca Cola signs, and and uh, when our company went by, we we marched right on past you know in a loose company formation. He come out on the porch. Well, it wasn't really a porch; it was two oil drums. He come out on the oil drums there, and he had a double barrel over and under twelve gauge shotgun. Now. Th that type of guy spends all of his money that he gets, whatever money he gets, you know. Yeah, well, occasionally he picks up my wrecked cars down on the highway. They go through the pockets, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. They really do. So you think this is not... They, they wait for the side of the road for, for people to hit the curve there. And they take the... Do you ever see this done out there, in way out in the boondocks, you know? It's, it's the equivalent. Uh, you know that in the last century... There was a great racket that still persists in certain parts of uh, the British Isles of changing the buoys offshore. So, you know, some guy tooling along in his, his freighter figures he's okay, everything's cool, you know, the, the buoy is off to his left where it's supposed to be or, or off to his right or whatever it might be, see. And uh, he gets out the charts and he's going along and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and the buoy is ringing away there with the lights and all that, and he's clearly in the channel, and all of a sudden, kapow, no bottom to the boat. And there he is up on the reef. He can't figure out what the hell happened, and the ship is sinking like that. And all of a sudden, all these guys come charging out of the woods and start rowing out to the boat, right? Well, 
what has happened is that uh, this little crowd has moved the buoy so that the ship slams into the rocks, and the next thing you know, they're, they're, they're dipping into the hold, and they're stealing everything. You know, they, they just pick, a, they pick that cleaner than a jaybird, you know, picking a cornfield. Well, well, this is an old tradition. In fact, you know what they call those guys? They have a, a name for them. It's not really piracy. It's another name. No, they're not scavengers. No, 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 no way. There is a name for them. Just like the word pirate, there is a name for guys that do this. And so, in fact, there was a great movie once made on this subject called Whiskey Galore. If you ever get a chance to see it on television, it's a great movie. It's these guys that move the buoy, and they're living on a Scottish island way the hell out in the, in the, in the middle of the sea there. One of these really bad-looking islands. Nothing but wind and two trees. Uh, that's right. They had a tree there. That was the whole point of the thing. They had this one tree that one guy brought back, and wind is blowing, and this ship uh, hit the rocks after they had moved the buoy, and the ship was loaded with whiskey, scotch whiskey. And that was the whole point of the, <laughs> the movie. That's why they call it, you know, whiskey galore. So, nevertheless, did you know that there are hillbillies out in the, out in the boondocks that will sneak out and change highway signs? So it says, danger ahead. Uh, S curve, uh, 30, 30 miles per hour, uh, maximum speed limit. Look out. There's a giant cliff. Well, they take that sign down and they replace it with one that says, resume 70 mile an hour speed limit. <laughs> so five minutes later, some poor guy in his cougar, you know, he's got his foot down on the floorboards and all of a sudden, out of the darkness, he's in the middle of a gigantic S curve with a cliff on one side, with a with a bottomless lake on the other side, and boom, he hits the wall, and these guys come charging out. See, <laughs> well, I don't have to tell you the awful scene that ensues, right? So anyway, this guy comes out on the porch, and uh, there was a little a great moment, a moment of uh, of uh, great education, because you know, I I'm. I, I have known about this because I'm from that part of the country, really. You know, out in Indiana, you, you meet a lot of these people who have drifted up. You know, got, uh, they got themselves a job in a clothespin factory or something down the street. So, you know, the Bumpus family is a very common family out in that area. But to the guys who are in my company from places like uh, Far Rockaway, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, we had guys that were from CCNY and my company. And they, think, uh, they think of hillbillies as Ma and Pa Kettle in the movies, kind of cute. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of friendly guys, you know, funny and cute. And they play guitars, and they appear at Max's uh, Kansas City once in a while after they made their record session with Mercury, you know. Well, the real thing, let me tell you, the real, the real country folk, uh, have been known to laugh out loud at the even, at the concept of Chris Christopherson. It just ain't no parallel between Chris Christopherson and, uh, and, uh, Buck Owens. And the real thing. First of all, they speak an English that is hardly intelligible. It has nothing to do with hee-haw, to begin with. That the language is often spoken with the simple blast of a 12-gauge shotgun, which makes a very forceful argument. I mean, it, it certainly makes its point. So he walks out, kaplooey! He shoots one up there, and, and he just swings that gun around twice, meaning, don't you step on that, on that property. That's a very big thing out there. You stay off my property. Well, that means, you know, you put one foot off the road and you're liable to find yourself walking on one foot for the rest of your life. Just like that, you know. And those guys are awful good with those shotguns. Oh, boy. So we went on fast and these guys are all in this company with me, see. And, uh, and I'm trodden out. I'm, I'm about halfway back in the, in the company, completely loaded with our uh, environmental bivouac gear. Uh, you know, like uh, entrenching tools. Uh, various types of equipment, the trench knives, and uh, the whole bit, 79 pounds of stuff on my back, including an M1, tin hat, and I'm um, clumping along there. And this guy next to me named Carlin, who was from Brooklyn, the only guy I ever knew that was in the Army from Brooklyn. You always see him in the movies, you know, I never knew one. And and uh, he there he was, he's clumping along next to me. I wonder if Carlin is listening tonight. Carlin says to me, he says, uh, Hey, what was that? I said, Carlin. I said, uh, you mean you didn't recognize what he was? He said, my God, was that a bear? I said, no, Carlin, that was not a bear. That is the king of the local terrain. 
and uh, he's he's got this thing in the back there that makes this stuff that they all drink. And if you if you step over on that property, Carlin, you're going to be walking sideways the next time you go to see the Yankees play. And he says, he says, you mean that was a man? I said, it certainly was, Carlin. Well, generically speaking, I suppose you'd have to say. Yes, I mean, uh, he's uh, the evolutionary scale, as Darwin has pointed out, travels different. It travels in different directions in the island republics. And this has been an island here. In fact, those guys were living there before Columbus came. And, uh, you know, and that's why nobody's come near them since. They just don't let nobody show up. Well, no, they don't necessarily smell like that. They don't. No way. No, 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 no. After you've been drinking the stuff them guys have been drinking for a long time, you have a smell that is very different from what hexachlorophene gets rid of. It is a, I don't know, it's a curious smell. It's a odd, <laughs> it's, a, it's an animal smell, really, is basically what it is. So we, we go on past, and the guys were beginning to get an idea that this was not a camping trip. We're not going out camping. Uh, you know, they, you don't buy your stuff down at Herman's and go camping in this world. So we get out into the berry patch after another 15 miles into the wilderness. And the berry patch consisted of this marsh that just was, you know, for, for all around us was the marsh. And and there was one high point of ground, which, uh, you know, it was, it really wasn't a high point of ground. It was it consisted of, you know, like like a humus heap of, uh, of uh, rotting cattails. We, we set up our camp there. We, we put down our tent pegs. We put up our uh, shelter halves. And I, I'm uh, squatting in my shelter half with Goldberg. And Goldberg was always my shelter half, my, my pup tent, uh, my pup tent buddy. See, so we're squatting in our, our shelter half. And uh, Goldberg brings up the obvious, you know, right there. He, said, he says, boy, he said, uh, where do you go for a beer around here? I said, Goldberg, that's the whole point of this thing. You know, you don't go for no beer here. We're we're out in the we're out in the environment, and uh, we are going to have to make do with what we got. And the whistle starts blowing, and we all fall out on the humus heap. And at that point, Kowalski addresses the company, brief address, and uh, the gist of it was, now look here, men. We're out here to live off the land. I want none of you guys. I don't want not one of you guys. Not one of you guys. If I find that one of you guys has opened one package of K-rations, you is going to be in so much trouble that you're going to wear your elbows out working them brushes. Now, you are issued, each one of you in your pack got three K-rations. You are coming back to the post with three K-rations. We are living off the ground, off the land. Now, that's the whole point. We are out here pretending that we are surrounded, we got no supplies, and we have to make it for 30 days. Now, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Well, the first thing that happened was that every one of us on this 25-mile trek into this this uh, hellhole had drunk all of our water in the canteens. I had no water in my canteen at all. So naturally, the guy starts uh, you know, hollering, where's the lister bag? A uh, lister bag is what they keep the water in in the army. You know, it's got these four little little nozzles on the bottom, and it hangs from a tree. Well, <laughs> uh, Kowalski has sent down into the swamp our water detail, which has come back with a lister bag full of swamp water. Now, that it presents an interesting problem. You have your choice now at this point. We are going to be there for 30 days. The question is, are you going to either die of thirst or are you going to drink out of the lister bag? Well, to a man, Company K, including the water detail, elected to die of thirst. <laughs> I, I, I remember Goldberg sitting in the tent saying, I'm not going to drink any of that stuff. I mean, look at it. And, and, and I might add that the swamp water was a curious combination of blue-green it was it was a brownish bluish green that was algae. It was about ninety seven percent algae, uh, about oh, I'd say twenty to thirty uh, percent fermented turtle remains, uh, all kinds of uh, just, well, you know, when 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 uh, when generation after generation of water moccasin has lived and died in the water, you get a rich a rich uh, mixture, a rich uh, highly nutritious brew. 
And uh, so the water was was evil looking water. I mean, it was it was a dark brown, green, coffee colored water. I, you know, you, have you been close to a real swamp lately, friends? Well, they just filled up the the the, the lister bag full of this water, and they hung it. <laughs> they 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 took crossed rifles. You know, they put three rifles as a tripod, and they hung it down in the middle, and that was the water. Period. And the water. Okay, that into which they had put. Now, see, there is a thing in the army that they call purification tablets, M3. Now, the purification tablets look like aspirins, and everybody is issued these things. You get these, per you're supposed to put them in your canteen and all that. And so, at that point, the orders come out that everybody has to put two tablets in each canteen full of water. Now, they refused to concede this stuff was anything other than water. They simply said water. Well, so <laughs> I take two of my tablets and I, I put it in the canteen and say, well, uh, to begin with, these tablets, if you think that you've tasted some bad stuff in your time, the tablets themselves, uh, well, I'll tell you what the tablets taste like. Have you ever smelled bluing? Okay. The tablets taste like concentrated bluing. It's not exactly the kind of thing you want to wash down your meal with. But, uh, so I wasn't taking any chances, so I put these two tablets in my water, my water canteen, and we started to wait them out. Well, one by one, after about the second day sleeping in these tents, one by one, guys began to drift down to the blister bag. A very interesting thing to see. They'd drift down, you'd see guys standing around the lister bag just looking at it, and they'd walk over and they'd sniff it. And uh, even some guys filled their canteens. They'd sniff their canteens. The third day goes by, and we are living on, if you, know what, you know what we're living on, we're living on what they call emergency rations. Now, what is emergency rations? This is not a K ration, by the way. The emergency rations we had were packed hard Stuff that uh, it's hard to describe it as anything but stuff. Uh, it was stuff that was that was pressed. It's supposed to have like 12 million vitamins in it. It was like pressed raisins and pressed uh, bone marrow. Uh, yeah, it's a curious uh, mixture of, of stuff laced all together with a, with a sort of concrete chocolate, and you chewed on this thing. That was what we were eating. Well. After about two and a half days of that stuff, I'm sitting in my tent, and I have not had a drink of water in two and a half days. And I want to tell you, my mouth felt like like it was made out of cotton batting. You know, it's, it's an awful feeling. Have you ever gone two or three days without drinking any water at all? It's a curious feeling. It's very different from from uh, being hungry. To begin with, when you don't drink water, you get a lightness in the head. Your head begins to get very, uh, almost like, you know the feeling you have when, you, when you're when you about to get a cold and you get this curious lightness, this uh, odd uh, feeling like uh, your head is floating around somewhere about three or four feet above your shoulders. And uh, while I'm sitting in there, I get this light feeling. And Goldberg is laying flat in the tent there, and uh, he's been sleeping. And I finally said, I've got to get a drink. I can't stand it. And I go down to the water bag, the lister bag. And there's about four other guys down there, and they're filling their canteens. And I just take this, this nozzle, and I fill the canteen up with this stuff, and I come back to the tent, and I sit down, and I sloshed it first. And you shake it up so that the, 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 the tablets get all mixed up with it, and I shake it up. And at that point, it began to bubble. Now, I don't know what was in the water that reacted with the tablets, but it caused a distinct chemical reaction because it was bubbling. Like it looked like I had a head on it, and uh, it, it kind of looked good now at this point. You see, because it was dark coffee green color, it looked like a curious kind of beer with a head on it, and it had been out in the sun now for about three days since they brought it back from the swamp, and the sun was beating down, and it was it was it was kind of like lukewarm coffee. So I squatted down on my blanket. And I said, here goes nothing. And I tilted it back, and I drank a whole canteen of this incredible liquid. Well, <laughs> as it started to go down, you know, if you drink something fast, you don't taste it. You know that. 
Uh, if you just drink it fast, well, I drank the whole canteen, which is a, which is a pint canteen. You've seen the aluminum canteens. I drink it down. And for a pregnant pause after I drank it, I could, I could, I could taste this stuff hitting me. And it was a taste that is truly indescribable. The only, well, uh, the closest I can think of to describe it, have you ever chewed up, chewed up, I'm talking about chewing it up, have you ever chewed up a cake of yeast? It was a moldy, strange, organic, <laughs> it did not taste like water. I can, uh, in no way did it taste like water. It's strange, organic taste. Well, I, 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 it, it tasted like I was, something was very rotten inside of me is what it really tasted like. You know, something had died inside of me and was now slowly fermenting. And I sat there for about maybe a minute and a half after I drank that down, tasting this fantastic taste, when all of a sudden it came up. One giant bubble of methane gas from inside. Whoop, like that. It just came up. I couldn't stop it out of my ears. Had I had... Uh, you know, had anybody lit a match in that tent, I mean, it would have gone sky high. Well, Goldberg sat up and woke him up. He heard this fantastic burp. He woke up and he said, what was that? And I said, I just drunk some of the water. I chickened out. He looked at me and he said, how was it? I said, it, it, it's funny, Goldberg. It's strange. And he said, how did it taste? Well, at that point, the relief of not being thirsty was so great, it overrode every conceivable issue in my mind. I said, well, I don't know. I'm not thirsty. That's all that comes. <laughs> you know, another herb comes up. Goldberg jumped up, ran out with his canteen. He loaded his up, and we sat there, each one of us, drinking canteens of that rotten water for about, I'd say, about three canteens apiece. Well, we finished our drinks. And somehow, we felt we felt good. You know, it was just a great feeling to be not thirsty again. Well, that that broke the ice. And from that time on, for for the rest of the thirty days, we drank this water with as much coolness as anything else. It's just like it's real water. We just drank it down. Because once you become really, man is unbelievably. Uh, uh, adaptable. He, I'm really, man is really adaptable. Now, a lot of animals wouldn't have done that, but man will. So we're drinking this water down. And, and after 30 days of drinking the water down, eating this, this, uh, pressed crud, and, uh, and messing around with the fermenting cattails, and mosquitoes, you wouldn't believe. I'm telling you, those mosquitoes have outboard motors and everything on them. So we, 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 the 30 days are up, we pack up, and we go hiking back into, into civilization. We march past this guy's house. There he is out there again. I see him. Don't worry. He fires off once more. We just keep right on going. He's still probably out there firing that gun off when anybody comes near him. We get back to this, to, to our tent, our camp city where we were, we were originally. And I, I remember the first taste of water that I had after that. The first taste of real water. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> it tasted terrible. <laughs> we were so used to this cruddy water that I got used to it and I kind of got to like it. After a while, you know, it was part of life. So I can only say to you, oh, another thing we got eating out there. This might be about some interest to you. Before we go any further, I have a Swiss air spot here. Uh, speaking of civilization, and if you'd like to try it, uh, Switzerland is a very civilized country and they have elegant water, incidentally, in Switzerland. It comes down from the Alps. Swiss Air has a quality tour to match any taste you may have, no matter how how strange. Car tours, alpine tours, tours that take you to every important country in Europe. They have tours. Uh, if you like that, you know, for example, a houseboat to Venice. That's kind of nice. A camper bus you can do. You know, you, if you want to ride on railroads, they have a tour. Two weeks traveling through Switzerland on 28 different railroads. That's going to go over big with all of you guys that ride the LIE every day. Uh, Swiss Air's sports and specialty tours, they've got them going, man. For more details, information, brochures, they'll send you a brochure. Call or visit your travel agent or Swiss Air at 608 Fifth Avenue. And the phone number is 995-4400. And here's a goodie. It says, if you've ever secretly thought about a facelift, <laughs> what kind of spot is this? It says, let me give you the formula for a fresher face. It's Formula 405 the deep action moisturizer to help revive dry, prematurely aging skin in as little as 10 days. 
Until recently, Formula 405 was only for the patients of over 2,000 dermatologists. But now the skin biochemist, Dr. Panzarella, the man who developed this breakthrough formula with its deep-acting hydrophilic elements, is making it available to all women without a prescription. Dr. Panzarella says, and we quote, What makes Formula 405 so different is that it carries moisture below the skin surface, actually encourages a buildup of the moisture that skin needs to look young and fresh. So, you can find it at Abraham and Strauss, among other places, Formula 405 Deep Action Beautifiers Lotion, Facial Cleanse Pat and Soap. Oh, that's exciting. I kind of like Dr. Panzarella. Dr. Panzarella. I like it with a little tomato sauce on it. Oh, you want to know what we lived on? What we ate there to, to supplement our diet? Well, do you know that you can take a... Are you aware of this, Jerry? You're a, you're a nature freak. Do you know that you can take the young, unformed cattail and uh, you can strip off the, the outer stripping of it. It comes off. Strip it off and you will find a succulent. That's what the uh, our environmental uh, survival kit said. A succulent inner husk, which is fully edible, especially if you happen to be a bear. It's very edible. Uh, if you happen to be from Fordham Road, I'm not sure. But uh, we, we stripped this thing off. See, and we had to sit around in a circle and eat this stuff. And all the while, this this uh, survival expert that was with us, who was a lieutenant, a very fresh-faced survival expert, walked around saying things like, Now, isn't that good? Now, isn't that good? Now, I want you, I want, you, want all you people, he was one of these uh, calling everybody people types. He says, Now, I want all you people to try this. Now, many of you have seen the dandelion. Now, how many of you know that when you uproot the dandelion, there is a succulent, delicious root, which once you... Oh, we're sitting there eating cattail guts. And so we, we, we'd spend every couple of hours eating cattails, eating the bottoms of, uh, of uh, such, uh, you know, such gustatory delights as uh, dandelion roots. And that was pretty good. We tried the berries. Uh, but the the only thing that the berries did, I'll tell you what the berries did, in case you're curious what those berries did. I don't know how the bears made out on it, but they sure were always down there eating them. Yeah, they said, stay away from the bears. Somebody suggested, why don't we pop one of those bears and try a little bear steak tonight? But the, no, 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 because where we go, there may not be bears. And we have to learn to survive on what's there. So, well, somebody said, well, they may not have cattails there either. He said, don't be a smart guy. Now, cut it out. Well, the berries we tried. I'll tell you what the berries did. If you can imagine the reciprocal of x lax No, 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 no. The reciprocal of x lax uh, Think carefully what I've said. And uh, this, this, this was unbelievably effective. I mean, you knock down three or four of those berries, and, uh, you know, everything stops for months. <laughs> Just like that. So uh, would you please uh, bring... That was tonight's salute to ecology. Please. Honey, dear, honey, dear, honey, dear. <laughs> well, it was a great experience, though. I enjoyed it. Great experience. Yeah, this is WOR New York, and you stay tuned for John Wingate and Nightbeat. Now, that's an order.